Do you know what your bank does with your money once you deposit it? Do you think it just sits there waiting for you to withdraw it? Not a chance. No, they take that money and try to make more money for themselves. All right, look, I might be able to understand that, but do you know the choices they're making with your money? And do those choices align with your progressive values? In our new documentary, Free Parking, we look at the building blocks of banking and find out what the banks do with your money once it's deposited. This special report is made possible by our friends at Aspiration, a financial firm with a conscience, allowing us to do well and do good. Find out how you can join the movement at aspiration.com slash TYT. The other day I was thinking, how can I have a get rich quick scheme? You know, how can I make a lot of money really fast? And I thought, the best way to make money is to open a bank. I played a lot of Monopoly as a kid. It wasn't invented during the Great Depression. It was invented by a woman at the turn of the century. So she makes this game, what we know as Monopoly, as a protest tool against monopolists. Very much a critique of capitalism. There are people that you can really think you know, be they friends or family, and then you watch them play Monopoly and a different person can come out of the woodwork. My grandma, if you saw her, is like a very tiny church-going lady and she would steal properties. Yeah, Maxine, I would not mess with her. For five years at any cocktail party, I was kind of the nut job because people would say, why are you writing a book about a board game? And it sounds really silly, but I do think that the story of Monopoly does tell us so much about U.S. history and the state of American business, maybe as much as even my Wall Street reporting during the crisis did. The goal of the Gabe Monopoly is to become a monopolist, which is to say control everything on the board. So if that means crushing your opponents, in fact it most likely will, so be it. The American financial system is this enormously complicated, intricate web of things. Typically, when I put my money in the bank, there's something comforting for most of us because you put your money in and then the number goes up and that's like a good feeling. However, the way that banks usually work is that you deposit your money and then they will use that to then borrow or loan. So if you're looking at a bank's balance sheet, there's this constant like tug and pull of what's actually going on behind the scenes that most consumers aren't really thinking about. So in banking, there's this idea that when you deposit your money, you get paid one interest rate for putting that deposit in. But they also have a part of their business that is lending money. And that's usually at a higher interest rate. So that difference between the interest rate they're paying you as a depositor and the interest rate that they are charging on a loan, that is the spread. Playing Monopoly is a good practice for a future banker. It teaches you to keep the reality at a big, long distance. You're trained not to care. It's a way of isolating you from the realities of the world you're impacting as if your impact didn't matter. And I think that makes us insensitive to one another and is highly dangerous in terms of the society. Every single ethical norm of banking that might ever have been invented by a lover of banks has been systematically violated. Laundering money, messing up the mortgage loan business, manipulating international interest rates, charging fees for services that were either excessive or simply outrageous by any normal standard. I mean, literally, everything we ever asked banks to do, they have befouled, by corrupt behavior. Nobody seems to care. They just do it, they get away with it, then eventually they get caught doing it, then they pay some fine. Why the charade? $12 million to the Citibank is the equivalent of your lying to somebody and being required to cough up a quarter. money in a bank or when your city puts tax dollars in the bank, they loan it out or invest it 
to the literally the most evil stuff imaginable. We're talking about planet destroying pipelines. We're talking about weapons like domestic gun making and bomb making overseas. The literal cages that are being used to separate undocumented families. If you buy an ice cream in Los Angeles, this is where your sales tax is currently going to help translucent, evil, bloodless, dead-eyed bankers and you know, snort cocaine and profit off of the demise of the world. You know, I'm gonna swallow the puke as I say this, but maybe this is the best that we've ever had. But let's talk about how it could be better. If we were to start from scratch, would we create the number of wealthy people that we have now and poor people. What would we make if we were making it all over again? To get past the point where we're like, well, yeah, but how are we gonna do that? Like, forget that. Like, we have to be able to think of another way. When people don't do well here, they're embarrassed because they're told that it's entirely their fault, right? This is the country where if you work hard, you can get ahead. What that means, the converse, is if you're not doing well, it's because you're lazy, and you're dumb. You only have to look around to realize that that's not true. You know, some of the hardest working people are some of the poorest. You may know you are smarter than your boss, right, about certain things, but that doesn't mean that um, you make more money. Well, that's how it is, what are you gonna do? That only benefits the most wealthy and powerful. That resignation is really important to keep things the way that they are. There's a different sort of approach to it. Mine is like, Every chance I get, I will fight a little bit. So if that means switching to a credit union, you know, like, and I cannot give money to a big bank, you give me that chance, I'm gonna take the chance. The real professional activists that get things done that I know don't live all or nothing lives, you know? They just work at it, decide a few things that you care about, figure out what you can do, what you would be most effective at, and then do it, you know? And that's, that's it. The banks successfully stole my home. I got fired from Bank of America only after I had a, a nervous breakdown. I ended up actually attempting a suicide. I lived in at home for 65 years and I lost it. They're all corrupt on a certain level. You lied to investors because if somebody like me don't get out here and do it, ain't nobody gonna do it. We came this close, not just to a financial crash, we had that. Every single major bank was bankrupt by the normal definitions of the term by October, November of 2008. We came that close to a general economic collapse. That's when the milk doesn't get delivered to the store so you can't feed it to your baby. That's when there's no bread. That's when the subway stopped running. Banks that were too big to fail in 2008, they're bigger now. Every single one of them and there's no greater control over that bigness than there was then. We have a banking system that proved that relying on it is the number one danger. Because look what it did and look how close it came. I lost my home to a foreclosure, a wrongful foreclosure. I had over $300,000 of equity. Today, I have nothing. I lost everything. It cost my marriage. It, it, it really uh, hurt my family, my kids, and I ended up homeless. I was actually homeless on the streets. Wall Street, the banks successfully stole my home. Here in California, the Attorney General settled on the mortgage fraud for $18 billion. People were jumping up and down. The foreclosure crisis cost California over a trillion dollars. So $18 billion, is that a really a punishment? I've been challenging fraudulent and erroneous billing from Bank of America. Well over 16,000, it was up to 25,000, but I've been paying it every month to keep the wolves, you know, from my front door. They use these bully tactics you know, to try to frustrate me and have me leave it alone or go away. And I'm not doing either. Whatever they can get out of you, predatory loans, things you don't understand, or to trick you, they'll do it. 
Of course they target people of color because they, they want to gentrify this community. I lived in at home for 65 years and I lost it. And the most horrible part was I didn't realize how corrupt everything was. My monthly payments went from $70, $80 to more than $140, almost double, plus the penalties. I couldn't keep up. I couldn't keep up with the payments. You feel like you probably like, oh, like this, like suffocating, and you feel helpless. They want you out, and the reason they want you out because they want to do something with your property. So they definitely don't care about you. They definitely don't have an interest in you. And until we do something about it, change the bank, they're going to always win. I couldn't handle the lies. I couldn't handle what was happening with the with the clients. It wasn't wasn't okay for me. We oversold intentionally and without the customer's consent. Debit cards. Debit cards were easy and we would approve you without your consent. And in the mail you would get a credit card or a notification for a personal line of credit that you didn't sign up for. Whether you checked it or not was kind of irrelevant for us. We got the sale and Wells Fargo had the account. I'm a single mom. I have two kids. Uh, that I need to support. I pretty much had a nervous breakdown on the job. Sales pressure, you know, just open accounts even if they don't need it. Uh, it's all about numbers, numbers, numbers. It, this, this is exploit. I felt, I, I felt exploited. I realized that it wasn't, it wasn't me. It was actually the banking industry that has this huge problem. Illegal things are not just happening at Wells Fargo. Bank of America is also having that that problem. Our employees were defrauding our customers and lying to their face. Nine out of 10 tellers were relying on public assistance. They could basically fire you anytime they want you, with and without a reason. If there is like a deadly disease and everybody is gone out of town, you know, there's no excuse at all. If you don't sell, you're out. And this fight inside me between my morals and seeing all of these fraud, fraudulent things, that resulted in me having a depression episode. Um, a very, very extreme depression episode that I ended up actually attempting a suicide. I realized that HR is getting paid by Wells Fargo, so they will never ever be on my side or on my customer's side. That's when I started speaking publicly, so I decided to become the first whistleblower against Wells Fargo Bank. Wells Fargo is not a lone wolf. Every single bank in the US, and I know that for a fact because we have a lot of bank workers from other banks telling us there is similar corruption. This is the idea that you could go to the post office and cash a check. And you could keep a small amount of money there, withdraw it whenever you need it, cash checks, just do basic banking functions at the post office. There are post offices in every community. And they need a renewed purpose. This was done before. So this would be really helpful for the poorest communities, people th that are at the bottom of our economic ladder who are paying these predatory fees, you know, to, to cash their checks and to, and to get loans once they get behind and really, you know, the whole system is designed to trip them up so that they never really get ahead and they're just paying and paying and paying. Yeah! Kill Bill! All right. My name is Joshua Trotsky and I like activism. For every dollar we spend on infrastructure, 50 cents goes directly to a banker's pocket because of interest. We need to reclaim our public money and use it for the public good. And that's what a public bank would do. We're the shareholders. Every, I, I've never been a shareholder before. I mean, I don't know if you could tell by my jorts, but I'm not a shareholder guy. Every member of the city of Los Angeles would be a shareholder, so it would be in the bank's interest to better the community. Los Angeles has somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 billion that can be invested in a people's bank. And that people's bank could invest in infrastructure, universal health care, low interest loans for students. Not only are we going to pay lower interest because we aren't dealing with the Wall Street middlemen who are taking and extracting profit out of our communities, but that interest that's paid on those loans goes right back into the bank. It's cycled back into our communities. From Los Angeles all the way to New York City, there are activists on the ground looking for a better alternative to Wall Street banking. There is one public bank in the United States. 
The Bank of North Dakota has been around since 1919, and it's in the reddest of red states. It provides loans for small businesses, for farms. It provides low-interest student loans. Those are our dollars. Those dollars need to be reinvested in our own local communities. For us to take back our power, we need to divest from Wall Street. For us to take back our power, we need to educate each other and come together in solidarity and realize that these banks are working against us, not with us. Enough is enough. I think too many people are becoming aware of the corruption um, from the big banks. We have no other choice and the time is now. I get passionate about it. <laughs> Strike one, it enriches the few at the expense of the many. Strike two, it falls apart constantly. Strike three, the worst people in the world are running it. So you're out, dude, you're out. Like, it's time to get a new system. This special report is made possible by our friends at Aspiration, a financial firm with a conscience allowing us to do well and do good. Find out how you can open an account that doesn't use your deposits to fund fossil fuel projects by going to aspiration.com slash TYT.